Okay, so we'll just start, you know, without them. They'll catch up a little bit later or they'll watch the video. Alright, so we did Streptococcus last time. So right now we'll go through Staphylococcus. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So, I don't have any. Yeah, I have some questions here. Can anybody tell me the flat, the five classes of strep? Let's just review real quick. Okay. Can Can anybody tell me? Can, give me one from from each person. Starting at you. Can you tell me uh, a strep class or or no? I don't remember. Do you remember any of them at all? No. All right, all right. Marion, do you remember any? This is the um the grouping. Yeah. Like a strep, there is beta hemolytic. Alpha hemolytic. No, not like that. Not gamma like hemolytic. That. I, I want the name. I want the name and of that specific strep. The name speak to them? Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so for, for specific streps, um, just give me one. Five names. I think streptococcus pneumonia. Yeah, that's one. Okay. Actually, here was one that was like um, right. That was right here. The, you know, one of the answers was in the other question. Wow. <laughs> Okay, but then okay, strep pyogenes is another one. Okay, can you one? Give me one. The relentless one? Which one? It have one that's had to be very dense. Strep very dense is another one. Very dense. Okay, can you guys mute after? Yeah, like the only I should be unmuted. Okay, Tanisha, can you give me one? That's three, mm -hmm. three so far. Strap. Here's strap. I got a group strap. I don't know. I really don't know. I just know strap A, B, C. I give you one. B, group. Yes, yeah, that was what I was saying. Strap um, B, group, group D, A, strap. B, C, D. Group B? Group D strap. Okay. Group B strap. There's a group B strap as well. Group B, right. group B isn't um, Agal Al. A galactia? Yeah, a galactia. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So group B strep is also known as strep a galactia. Um, okay, BB, because BB just joined us. One more question, and then we'll go on to the lecture, right? Can you give me two delayed autoimmune diseases caused by strep pagenes? Or give me one, at least. Rheumatic fever? Yes. And the other one would be sepsis, shock? I think it's yeah, something uh, else. Something with sepsis. No. What do you say? No, strep. You're not autoimmune. There is just. They, um, I think. Rheumatic fever. Another one. Strep. Um. Sepsis. I think Sep it was sepsis. Sepsis shock. I shock. Remember, I don't. I should never remember myself. But I think it was sepsis. Is it glomerulonephritis? Oh yes, yes, yes. It's yeah, very it's very not strep. Strep is not the um autoimmune one. It's yeah. glomerulonephritis, nephritis, and um the other one that is rheumatic yeah. fever, right? Okay. Good. Fantastic. So you guys remember something that's good <laughs> because I remembered the other one a while ago. <laughs> All right. So staphylococcus, right? So staphylococcus is also gram negative. And if you remember from before, mega positive, negative, gram that gram positive. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. It's also a gram positive. And if you remember from the, the before when we're differentiating strep from staph, is that staph is catalase positive, right? And that's important to remember. That staph is catalase positive, and strep is not catalase positive. So if you do a catalase test and catalase test is positive, you have staph. If you do a catalase test and a catalase test is negative, you have strep, right? So staph is found in the nasopharynx and the skin of about 50% of the people in the world. 
So about half of like the, the global population and stuff naturally in the flora, in the skin, and in the nasopharynx. Staph is also a common pathogen found in hospitals and has so, benef well, uh, so benefited from living in such survival of the fittest environment for, um, for bacteria and has developed various defensive virulence factors. As well as drug immunities. Immunities here. Okay, so there are three types of staff. Instead of the extra part five, right? So we don't have so much to remember this time around. So there are three types of staff staff aureus, staff epidermidis, and staff saprophyticus. Right? So how do you differentiate staff from strep? Does anybody remember how we differentiated staff from strep before? Like, so we did this already. This kind of just. Is it the same with the catalase? Yeah, catalase. Right. And the. And, yeah, go ahead. The the catalase and the other one is when they do the staining. Yeah, strip, when they do this. Mm -hmm. This be like a strip and stuff. The focus oh, should be like a uh, structure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. By chance, you screen sharing. Oh, I know. See, yeah, see. Okay, okay. okay. All right. Good. All right. So yeah, you guys are right. So the first thing I mean, gram staining. So from here, can visualize the shape of it on the microscope. So stuff is a grape-like cluster, and strep is a is a strip. Catalase stuff has the enzyme catalase. Strep does not have enzyme catalase. And also to note. Both staph aureus and um, strep pyogenes especially have beta hemolytic activity. And if you remember, beta, if it's beta hemolytic, that means they can lyse red blood cells completely. Whereas if it's alpha hemolytic, that means it can lyse red blood cells partially. But there's like one exception with staph. When staph is on blood agar culture, instead of um, leaving nothing, no pigment, it leaves a uh, golden pigment. And this is how you differentiate it from strep on blood agar culture. So if it was alpha hemolytic, no, you'd have a green looking pigment because you have um, a lot of bilirubin, in, right? So the staff can be further divided by a coagulase test. So this is an additional enzyme that staff, staff aureus has, is coagulase. So, and staff aureus is the only staphylococcus that has coagulase activity. The other um, staph epiderm epidermidis, this is wrong to epidermidis, and staph saprophyticus don't have coagulase activity. So if you get a negative test, you know that it's staph epidermidis or staph saprophyticus. A positive test, you know that it's staph aureus. That's all you need to remember for that. So shape, catalase activity, um, beta hemolytic activity, and coagulase activity, and that's that. So the first one, we're going to go through the Staph Aureus. And Staph Aureus is really, like, he's a really tough guy, right? So he has a lot of virulence factors. He, we're mostly just going to be talking about Staph Aureus throughout this whole lecture. Because Staph Epidermidis, Epidermidis and Staph Saprophyticus aren't that lethal. The Staph Aureus is very important to, like, know about. So one of Staph Aureus' standout features is the presence of a microcapsule that surrounds its peptidoglycan cell wall and contains transpeptidase, also known as penicillin binding protein. Um, does anybody remember which um, drug targets transpeptidase? Transaminase something? Something? No. Is it something? It's right here. Transpeptidase. Transpeptidase. Which which drug targets transpeptidase? Penicillin. Yeah, penicillin. I asked you which enzyme penicillin. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, it was a slip. It's okay. Yeah. So penicillin, right? So it has. It has transpeptidase, also known as penicillin binding protein. Staph aureus is also a beta hemolytic. I mean, it has the ability to lyse red blood cells. It's coagulase positive and a facultative anaerobe, so it can grow 
it can thrive even if there's no oxygen around. That's what facultative, that's what facultative anaerobic means if you can remember from way back when. We're going to go through some of these various factors. So, I want to go through, I want to go through these and then explain this picture after. So, um, I divided the virulence factors into immune disabler proteins versus tissue tunneling proteins versus exotoxins. So, these are all the virulent, no, there's more. No, these are all the virulence factors that you need to know. The exotoxins, tissue, tissue tunneling proteins, and immune disabler proteins. Right? So you can think of immune disabler proteins as all the defensive mechanisms. Like instead of the staff attacking, this is how it defends itself from um, white blood cells and antibiotics, right? So first one is protein A. And protein A, A has sites that binds the FC portion of um, immunoglobulin G and gives it defense against oxygenization and phagocytosis. So from the picture, you can see some immunoglobulins come in and whatever. And, you know, the staff has a shield and it can block the immunoglobulins from oxygenizing it. And that kind of um, prevents phagocytosis, right? Okay, so another immune disabler protein it has is actually the coagulase. So the coagulase, this enzyme activates fibrin formation around the bacteria and protects it from phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, right? But again, you see... Well, the coagulase here is represented by a shield and fibrin around it. So, the coagulate, so it's basically building a shield around itself with um, the host tissue. So it's activating the coagul um, coagulation cascade and building a liquid wall around itself. So it, can, it can't be attacked by any other white blood cells. Um, it has hemolysins, which is similar to um, strep, streptogenes. It has four types of hemolysins, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And they destroy red blood cells, neutrophils, macrophages, and platelets. Um, it has leukocytins, destroy white blood cells. Uh, community acquired, well, I'll get into this later, but community acquired methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus produces a particular leukocytin called Panton Valentine leukocytin or PVL. That frequently causes abscesses, so this is something to note, and I'll get into it later, right? Uh, penicillinase, so it's a secreted form of beta lactamase, and it disrupts the beta lactam portion of the penicillin molecule, therefore, in, thereby inactivating the penicillin molecule. So this is how it get, gets rid of. Is how it's not um, it's not susceptible to penicillin attack. So if with the penicillinase, it also has the transpeptidase that it needs it to build a peptoglycan cell wall, right? It has the transpeptidase and it's inhibited by penicillin. And some strains of Staph aureus have transpeptidase that is resistant to penicillins and cephalosporins. So you can already see how um, Staph is like it has more defense mechanisms than strep pyogenes, right? It's a bit more dangerous. It has um, more defenses. Okay. The tissue tunneling proteins that are treated you need to remember. And this is this helps um, staff to, to invade further into tissue, right? Into the into the body. They have high hyaluronidase, staphylokinase, and lipase. So hyaluronidase helps pathogens to spread. And this protein breaks down proteic glycans in connective tissue. So it's like boring a hole to help it to dig dig through, right? Staphylokinase, this protein lyses lies, form fibrin clots. So if there's some, um, the, the body's trying to build some scar tissue and prevent it from moving deeper, staphylokinase can just knock that out, right? Lipase is enzyme degrades fats and oils, which often accumulate. Protease destroys tissue proteins. I think that's pretty straightforward. So I guess the most important, I guess the most weird ones out there would be hyaluronidase. You saying it wrong, and staphylokinase. And I think if you remember, there was a streptokinase, right? Streptokinase had a streptokinase virulence factor. Well, it's the same thing. It's just called a different name because it's a different bacteria, right? So this is staphylokinase. So you have exotoxins. So this is like the hair is like represented as a cannon. 
right? Because it can, it doesn't, it, it moves from the the bacteria that can circulate the blood, um, circulate the blood circulation, right? Bloodstream. So the first one you have exfoliating, which is a diffusible exotoxin that causes the skin to slough off, resulting in scarlet skin syndrome. And we'll get into that later. Enterotoxin is an exotoxin that causes food poisoning, resulting in vomiting and diarrhea. And you also have toxic shock syndrome, also known as TSST1. This is specifically for Staph aureus. And similar to the strep pyogenesis pyogen pyogenic exotoxin, but is far more deadly. And is dubbed a supertoxin, right? So this exotoxin binds to MHC, MHC class 2 molecules and macrophages and elicits a massive T cell response and all point of cytokines, resulting in toxic shock syndrome. So this exotoxin is produced by about 20% of Staph aureus strains. So it's not, so you, so I guess you'll, you'll find, you'll find, so by these statistics, you'd find this toxin in one in five um, Staph infections, right? And it's very dangerous, so it's not something to take lightly. We're getting to some of the diseases from exotoxins. First one being gastroenteritis. So staphylococci can grow in food and produce exotoxins. The victim will eat food with preformed toxin, which will then act on the intestinal tract, stimulating peristalsis with ensuing nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. It presents with occasional fever. A typical episode will last um, anywhere from about 12 to 24 hours. Right, so this disease is not too serious, and I think if you remember from from the strep, when I was talking about strep, I said that uh, staff staff aureus grows in the nose, right? So you have somebody cooking food, preparing food, and they pick their nose, and they they still cook in the food, right? They don't wash their hands after they pick the nose. So this could cause gastroenteritis, and it would usually last between 12 to 24 hours. Um, next one, toxic shock syndrome. So the staphylococcal exotoxin TSST1 can be thought of as a combination between food poisoning enterotoxin and pyrotoxin that causes scarlet fever. Because the TSST1 causes both, right? So this syndrome involves sudden high fever, nausea, vomiting, watery diarrhea, followed by a diffuse erythematous rash, then peeling of the skin, also known as desquamation of the palms and um, the feet. So here's a graphic showing you the possible signs and symptoms of toxic shock syndrome. High fever, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, redness of the eyes, mouth and vagina, sunburn like rash, muscle pain or myalgia, and low blood pressure, right? Okay, shock. Anytime you hear shock, you need to think about low blood pressure. The toxic shock syndrome also is commonly caused by leaving a tampon in for a long time. I think Bibi was talking about this last time. How oh, this um, toxic shock syndrome can be caused by uh, tampons. Okay? So TSST1 is secreted and penetrates the vaginal mucosa, further stimulating cytokines T um, tumor necrosis factor and um, interleukin 1, which results in an aggressive inflammatory response and subsequent shock. I have a graphic here just to show this too. So you have the tampon, the, tam the tampon has um, staph aureus on the tampon. And it's an old tampon, right? So it's been around, it's been in the vagina for a while now. And it's uh, producing exotoxins, and then exotoxins can um, bore through the vaginal mucosa and cause disease. So you see from here, early phases present with flu like symptoms, fever, rash, and hypotension. Some of the clinical features, stretching of disease range from mouth to leg symptoms, rapid loss of function in various organ systems, high fever, headache, irritability, confusion. You have adult respiratory distress syndrome, diarrhea, um, nausea, and vomiting. And you treat this by removing the tampon, obviously. You have the same thing, this formation of palms, soles, toxic shock syndromes, symptoms, right? The treatment involves cleaning the foci, removing the tampon, which is kind of obvious. Obviously, remove the tampon. Why would they leave it in if that's causing the disease? 
or drainage of the affected wound along with supportive care, antibiotics will kill the bacteria but not stop the symptoms as it's caused by exotoxin. Right? If we had a gram-negative um, bacterial infection, would the antibiotics stop the symptoms then? Repeat what you just said. If we had a gram-negative bacterial infection and you gave the patient antibiotics, would it stop the symptoms? A gram-negative. Because in this, in this situation, we have a gram-positive, right? And we give, the, we give the patient antibiotics to kill the bacteria, but the symptoms don't succeed, they don't stop after. So I'm clipping it. If, if we're in a gram, like you've had a gram negative, you've had a gram negative bacteria, and we gave the patient antibiotics, would it stop the symptoms? Well, it depends which one. I mean, I guess so. I don't think the same thing applies. No. Okay, one last time. Mario, Mario. I think it depends which type they give them because if you would give them Naman penicillin, then the gram negative are resistant to that, so it wouldn't well, do yeah, any that's, justice. That's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. I just, I mean, give them the specific antibiotics that they need. Okay. Well, anyways, it would be yes, it would stop the symptom because remember the gram negative has endotoxin, so it's connected to the to the bacteria itself. The reason why giving antibiotics to a gram positive um infection affected um, patient doesn't stop the symptoms is because the gram positive secretes exotoxins. So the exotoxins, once they're secreted, they don't have anything to do with the bacteria anymore, right? So unless you could stop the exotoxin from doing what the exotoxin is gonna do, you're not gonna stop any of the symptoms. But if the, you have a bacteria, a gram negative bacteria that has the endotoxin connected to its cell membrane, then if you give them antibiotics, it kills the gram negative and kills the endotoxin. Although, um, I would add, because maybe this is why Tanisha said no, is if you lyse the gram-negative bacteria, there's a chance that the endotoxin could end up in the blood circulation and you could have um, continued symptoms. So this is kind of a really tricky answer to give. So I guess it was good thinking by everybody still. Okay. Next disease is staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. <laughs> And some staph aureus strains produce exfoliative toxin A and B, which produce distant effects from the localized site of infection. It usually affects neonates with local infection of severed umbilical, severed umbilical cord or older children with skin infections. The, the exfoliate toxin, or this exotoxin. Whatever it's spelled, I don't remember. Exfolitoxin causes cleavage of the mid epidermis with fine sheets of skin peeling off, revealing moist red skin beneath. Okay, healing is usually quick and mortality is low. The physician should make a differential diagnosis in case of scarlet skin syndrome being the result of a drug allergy. And if it's the result of a drug allergy um, and you're treating them for a staphylococcal infection, then they could end up dying, right? Because you don't know it's a drug allergy and the, the patient is have this drug in their system and you don't, you don't think to flush it out as you think is a staph infection so this is something else to know but you can also get these symptoms from um from a drug allergy this is like what scarlet skin syndrome looks look like you have some little rashes here you're peeling at the skin and um you know it, it reveals like the um bright red under it right Okay, so we have diseases from direct organic invasion. And this is kind of to remind you of all the diseases. So you have first you have pneumonia, you have meningitis and brain abscess, you have osteomyelitis, you have acute endocarditis, you have septic arthritis and a skin infection. So this is quite a lot of diseases. So six diseases in all. I remember if I'm if I remember correctly, strep streptogenes gave us four four infections, four direct organ invasion infections. 
and two delayed autoimmune responses. So, okay, first one, pneumonia. So, staph aureus is a rare but severe cause of community acquired pneumonia. As the number one cause is strep pneumo, right? For pneumonia. Strep, pneum strep pneumonia is the number one cause of strep of community acquired pneumonia. The staph is rare. The staph is a rare but severe case of community um, acquired pneumonia and no no nosocomial pneumonia, also known as um, hospital acquired pneumonia. It usually follows a viral influenza infection with sudden high fever, chills, and low bar consolida consolidation in the lung, rapid disruption of lung parenchyma, resulting in lung cavities, and vi violent destructive pneumonia frequently causes effusion and empyema, which is Post in the plural space. So it's just I think I think this part is probably the most important part to know. Just just to know that the fact that it usually follows a flu infection. Okay. Um, we have meningitis, cer cerebritis, or brain abscess. So a patient presents with high fever, stiff neck, headache, obtundation, or lagging alertness. So they kind of you know all over the place. Coma and focal neuro neurologic signs. So I guess they can't they can't um react to certain stimuli as a person normally would. We also have osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection that usually occurs in boys um, less than twelve years of age. Infection spreads to the bones hematogenously, presents a warm swollen tissue over the bone with systemic fever and shakes. You have acute endocarditis, which is a violent destructive infection of the heart valves with sudden onset of high fever, chills, and myalgia. You have vegetation, they call it vegetation, that grow rapidly on heart valves causing valvular destruction. And embolisms from the vegetation can travel to the brain if the mitral valve is involved, or it can travel to the pulmonary circulation if the tricuspid valve is involved, right? So IV drug users with staph A infection usually usually develop right-sided tricuspid valve endocarditis and present with um, present with pneumonia caused by bacterial embolization from this infected valve. Right. So just like um, strep viridans, right? Staph A can also cause some valvular um, can also cause endocarditis or valvular destruction. And this one is 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 worse than the strep, right? Because the strep viridans was a subacute, subacute bacterial endocarditis. This one is acute endocarditis, so it's a lot more destructive, and you know it's a lot more dangerous. And just to remember, if it's from if it's from the mitral valve, if you have the mitral valve being infected, that it's going to affect the brain. If you have the tricuspid valve being infected, it might affect the pulmonary circulation or the lungs, right? Uh, patients with staph endocarditis usually have no history of valvular disease or heart murmurs. Endocarditis is also caused by strep viridans and group B strep, but onset is much more gradual. So you can you can you can differentiate um, which bacteria you might have if your patient shows up with endocarditis based on how how fast and how um, aggressive the endocarditis is. So if it's more aggressive, you know, it's staff, it's less aggressive, you know, it's probably strep. All right, septic arthritis, which is invasion of the synovial membrane, results in a closed infection of the joint cavity. So patients will present with an acute, painful, red swollen joint with limited range of motion. You know, and you have to act very quickly because if you leave this patient alone, they might permanently lose the function of that joint, right? So staph aureus is the most common cause of this disease in children and patients um, older than 50 years of age. Diagnosis will require an, ex an examination of the synovial fluid, which will appear yellow and turbid with a large number of neutrophils. The joint needs to be drained and antimicrobial therapy needs to be given. So, you know, if you don't, if you don't help them out with the septic arthritis, they might not be able to move that limb again. So you gotta be quick on your feet. Right, so skin infections can be caused by either strep or staph 
or both of them. So you can have strep and staph infection at the same time. And this usually follows a major or a minor break in the skin with scratching of the site, spreading the infection, right? So there are four type, subtypes of skin infections that are ex experienced on the um, staph infection. So you have impetigo, which is a contagious skin infection usually around the face and oral cavity. The small vesicles become pustules or pustules which, cr which crust over to become honey colored, wet and flaky. And I, I should have gotten a picture of impetigo to show you, but I don't, so you look that up in your own time. But it looks kind of gross, you know. But yeah, that happens. Cellulitis, this is a deeper infection of the cells. The tissue become hot, red, shiny, and swollen. Uh, local abscesses, foruncles, and carbuncles. It's, these are all collections of pus. So if you have an infection of a hair follicle, it produces a single pus filtrator with a red rim. This infection can penetrate deep into the subcutaneous tissue to become a furuncle. So from the furuncles now it may bore through to produce multiple contigu contiguous painful lesions communicated on the skin called carbuncles. And abscesses usually need to be surgically drained. Uh, last one now wound infections. Well, last of the skin infections, wound infections. So if you have a open wound infected with staph aureus, it can result in abscess cellulitis or both abscess and cellulitis. And when a sutured post-surgical wound becomes infected, it must be reopened and is often left open to heal by secondary intervention from bottom of the wound up wound outward. Okay, blood and catheter infections, staph aureus can migrate from the skin and colonize central venous catheters, resulting in bacteremia, septis, sepsis, and septic shock, as well as endocarditis. So you can see these are a lot of diseases. So we have blood and catheter infections, which kind of um, is like an umbrella, umbrella for skin infections and bacteria, right? And sepsis. Um, skin infections with all this impetigon, cellulitis, and abscess, and etc. etc. Septic arthritis, acute endocarditis, which I would argue is probably the, the probably most dangerous thing here. Osteomyelitis, meningitis. And pneumonia. Well, pneumonia. Pneumonia and then endocarditis are probably the most dangerous things right here. Alright. Anyways, moving on. So, there's. We're getting to um, MRSA now, right? So, MRSA is staph aureus that has gained, um, like a gain of function uh, genes from, from the environment, or it's it, it survived to being under a lot of stress, like in the hospital setting. Right? This is MRSA. So most staph aureus are penicillin resistant because they secrete penicillin A's. So penicillin drugs like mesicillin, nafcillin, or and other penicillin A's, resistant penicillins are used to kill staph aureus instead of regular penicillin. Um, MRSA is a strain of staph aureus that has acquired multi-drug resistance against both mesicillin and nafcillin through genetic acquisition via acquired chromosomal DNA segment MEC capital A, which encodes a new penicillin binding protein 2A that takes over the job of the transpeptidase when it is inhibited by penicillin, right? Okay, so this um, effect is an is an effective uh, defense mechanism to protect its peptidoglycan cell wall. So basically, you have the penicillin, the penicillin normally just targets the, the transcriptidase, right? But this new type of staph aureus with this, um, with this new DNA segment, it has a second um, penicillin binding protein that can, it has a second transcriptidase that can take over the job when tran the regular transcriptidase is, is being acted on by penicillin. So it can survive penicillin no problem, right? Most um, MRSA strains emerge in the hospital under the influence of heavy antibiotic use. Um, vancomycin is a drug of choice to deal with, uh, to deal with MRSA for, from hospital-acquired infections. Unfortunately, there are now some strains that are resistant to vancomycin. 
called VRSA, so Vancal Myosin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So, um, if you guys remember, I said that Vancal is like the silver bullet for gram, gram positive organisms. So, if Vancal Myosin can't kill a gram positive bacteria, that's a, that's that's really, you know, a really tragic situation. So, they have a really dangerous bacteria out there that's just getting stronger and stronger every year. Yes. That's something to be concerned about and I guess is um why you see some doctors will say like you know they don't like um doctors prescribing too much broad spectrum antibiotics or or you're giving antibiotics to people that don't really need antibiotics because this this is why it causes right it causes bacteria to become more resistant to antibiotics and then you might be in a situation where there's no antibiotics that can kill that certain bacteria so they are believed to have acquired a transposon van A from vancomycin resistant enterococcus. So you can see this is a good um, example of one bacteria from a different family giving another bacteria from a different family its own genetic elements. So this enterococcus was resistant to vancomycin and it gives the ability to, to the MRSA, right, to become versa. So, vancomycin resistant enterococcus modifies an alanine amino acid in the peptoglycan cell wall and it changes it to lactate instead of alanine, instead, which has a low affinity for vancomycin. So, vancomycin actually attacks this specific amino acid in the peptoglycan cell wall. So, if you um, substitute it for another amino acid, then that's the way of skirting vancomycin action, right? So some MRSA is acquired in the community as well and is the community acquired MRSA. So there have been some cases seen among some sports teams that share close presenting to each other. So you have, you know, you have people like, I guess you have people in boys' home, soldiers, same type of people that are in close quarters together. They're at um, increased risk for um, contracting community acquired MRSA. The staph aureus is a common pathogen in nostrils and skin folds of humans and this leads to propensity to form skin and soft tissue infections which then acts as a, re a reservoir for the pathogen. Community acquired MRSA has a resonance factor of Panton Valentine leukocytin or PVL which is associated with a propensity to form skin abscesses. Both hospital acquired MRSA and community acquired MRSA carry a gene that carries multi-drug resistance that can be transferred to other bacteria called SCCMEC, uh, which also known, well, known as staphylococcal cassette chromosome conferring resistance amicillin, which is a crazy ass name. And it's just too long, so there's SCCMEC. However, the older hospital acquired strains, so this is from the, the, no, no, the nosocomial infections from the first, the first MRSA is believed to, to transfer much slower than the community acquired strains um, um, DNA segment, right? So as, as a result, the community acquired strain is much more efficient at transferring its, its genetics to other staff or other, and other bacteria. So the treatment for these superbugs are clindamycin and a drug called trimethoprim sulfamexoxazole, right? And this is some some comic thing just to say like yeah it's, it's just getting stronger all right so we have the last two staph epidermidis so this staph is part of our natural flora it is coagulate negative unlike staph aureus which is coagulase positive so the staph epidermidis has a polysaccharide capsule that allows adherence to prosthetics and can also form biofilms to enhance its adherence to those prosthetics. So biofilm, I don't remember, I don't remember which exact bacteria we talked about last time that forms a biofilm. But biofilm is pretty much just like the, the bacteria creating a wall around itself so it can't get phagocytized so easily. This pathogen normally does not cause infections. It affects immunocompromised patients with polyurine catheters or IV, or IV lines that can become affected when this organism migrates from the skin along the tubing of the IV lines of the catheters, right? So this 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 organism is, a, is an all of us, right? All of us have this on our skin. 
we usually won't get infected with this guys not that it's not that virulent it's only if we're like in an immunocompromised state or you know we have some type of prosthetic inside of us or etc etc so staph epidermidis also cause infection of prosthetic devices such as prosthetic joints and prosthetic heart valves and peritoneal dialysis catheters it is the most frequent organism isolated from infected prosthetic devices so staph epidermidis can leach out after it adheres and forms a biofilm to cause bacteremia and sepsis so although it's not as dangerous as staph aureus it still can become dangerous right in especially in an uncompromised immunocompromised person okay staph epi is also a frequent skin contaminant when taking blood cultures so when you're just taking a blood culture for whatever reason somebody needs to do a blood test or a drug test or whatever the reason is staph epi is usually a, a contaminant when taking the blood cultures right because it's on our skin so when the, the needle bores the skin then some staph epi might get into the needle and it might cause like a differential so somebody might think oh sh oh shit this this man has bacteremia or sepsis or but then it's actually not that it's just it's just some of the stuff epi from your skin got into the needle and you know they're drawing this conclusion so it's how we differentiate if you think that you, you, you might have a, um, a staph epi um, bacteremia happening you want to draw blood from two sites right so you can draw blood from say the arm and the leg and you can determine if it's merely a skin contaminant or it might be staph induced bacteremia so if only one culture grows then you know that it's bacteremia for sure no uh, no no say that man say that yeah, man, that's right. If only one culture grows, then it's, it's bacteria. If both grow, then it's a contaminant. Um, why from those two areas? Why from which two areas? Oh, from the, the, the arm and the leg? The skin? Yeah, anywhere, yeah. anywhere that you bore your skin. It could be anywhere. Anywhere you want to bore them. But you're taking the blood, right? What mm -hmm. sense it make? Um, Just my because say, yeah. that epi, this is a skin skin stuff right if you're taking the blood why what's the sense taking the blood if it's on the skin why that is what i was thinking okay okay let me explain let me try to give an explanation i think this is like if maybe you're in a situation where you took the blood culture and you think that the amount of staph epi is too much like you think maybe it's more than usual or whatever and you just want to make sure that it's not a bacteremia so you don't want to send a patient home and they actually have blood they have to have a um, bacteria in the bloodstream so even though it's like a, it's a natural thing and it's probably a contaminant you just want to in case so you want to make a differential diagnosis okay i think okay. i get it so now i'm thinking um okay mm -hmm. so if it's in it's on the skin it's, it's usually on the skin or whatnot right yeah. let's say it's on the skin so when you're born now and you it, you possibly infect or infect the person with infect the blood, let's mm -hmm. say, with this um bacteria, then when you when you draw the the um blood the from needle. this the, yeah. the arm and the foot or what's not, when you draw it from there, I'm guessing that you just check in, like you it still will show up in the um blood culture because if it does if it's infected right. So it will mm -hmm. still show up because it's in the blood. Which is well, like true. he's saying that that okay, no matter where you put the needle, whether it's on your skin in on your hand or your skin in your leg, you will have the staphylococcus epidermidis. Yeah, yeah I guess I get like, it. I get but like if saying, it's though. an infection in your blood, then it's gonna be more than usual. And all two sides can get it. So like then it's when you're gonna know it's an actual contaminant. Or actually a bacteria, a bacteremia or whatever. Wait, I get what you're saying, doing on um, I need to check again to see if this is right. If it's if it's one culture or if it's two cultures, is the difference. I need to check. I need to double check. I'll but highlight it. Yeah, we highlight. So I'll check and tell you guys. That's my mistake. I mean, I should be. I should have the you know the short thing to tell you. But yeah, that's that, right? 
Okay, so last thing now is Staff Sapropheticus, and this is not that, this is, there's nothing really to note about it, but I guess the most important thing to note is that it, it, it causes UTIs in young sexually active women, so let me read this through. The Staph Sapropheticus is a gram positive just like the rest of the staff. It's a coagulase negative just like Staph epi. It's non hemolytic like Staph epi. Yeah, Staph epi is non hemolytic. Yeah. And it cause, it's a common cause of uncomplicated urinary tract infection, usually in young sexually active women. And this organism is second to E. coli in the leading cause of urinary tract infections in females. And that's the end. I don't think there's anything else I wanted to tell you guys. No, that was it. All right. Let's go through some of these questions. So, Alicia, you first. Give me the three types of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh my, Staph Staphylococcus aureus. Yes. Staphylococcus pneumoniae, I think. No. And Staphylococcus. No. No. Um, Staphylococcus pneumoniae. Oh. Okay. Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus. Um, that last one was Staphylococcus epidermis, or that was strep. It was the last one we just did a while ago was staff um well they didn't but epidermidis is another one the yeah, second one right so last I one, one. Um, yeah, the last one okay sorry and just now arias epidermidis and uh, sarophyticus saprophyticus no yeah yeah, yeah. Sarophyticus. Yes. Okay. close enough close okay. enough saprophyticus okay cool okay and the the, the most important one out of that because it's staff or yes because it's the most dangerous one right yeah all right so next person is bb which bacteria causes tampon mediated sepsis is it staphylococcus aureus yes it was so follow-up question okay. is which virulence factor is believed to be the primary to be primarily responsible for this disease is this Staphylococcus um, virulent something? Virulent I don't know. It was the toxic shock um, syndrome toxin. TSSP. Oh, and the yeah. exotoxin. Exotoxin. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Atia, you can you can get some help with this one. I don't remember all of these virulence factors. Okay, okay. Okay, so BB and I'm going to answer this. All right, so I'm, give me. Sorry? Yeah, all I remember is um, the exotoxin one. Okay. Lyes. 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 That's another one. Mm -hmm. Dehemolytic Staphylokinase. That's another one. Um, so she said exo um, and exotoxins. Hemolytic one, the alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Hemolysin. Protease. Protease. is another one. That's five. <laughs> yeah, that's just more than five. It says at least, at least. So if you want to just go off, that's fine. Okay. I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't remember for strep what it what it was. It was like um the what do you call these things? The the capsule. It yeah, had yeah. it had um the, the stick out. The, the polysaccharide capsule. Right, the capsule, something else, some other ones. With those same protease like um lice. It had ligase too. It had streptokinase and a bunch of other things. Yeah. And one thing I want to note about the virulence factors, I wanted to note um, penicillinase, right? Yeah, penicillin because strep didn't have penicillinase, but staph has penicillinase, and penicillinase prevents penicillin from working properly. Oh, that's why it's resistant to penicillin. Exactly. All right. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. 
Marian, you're up. Give me three diseases caused by exotoxin release caused by Staph aureus. Three? From, I said from. Yeah, three. Okay. Toxic syndrome. Gastroenteritis. Yeah. Um, some skill, skill skin syndrome. Yes, college skin syndrome. It's college, it's college. Yeah. College, yeah. Okay, nice. All right. Finish the last one, the best for last. Give me, or oh, you can get help with this too. Give me at least five diseases caused by direct organ invasion. Um, by staph aureus. It has a skin. What is skin one called? You could just say skin infection. Yeah, skin infection. Um. Oh, the. Um. Yes, yeah, so we have um sepsis arthritis. Yes, yeah, septic arthritis. Acute endocarditis. Okay, that's yeah, so another one. Osteo meningitis. Meningitis is another one. And then I have the osteo something. Osteomyelitis. Pneumonia. And pneumonia is another one. That's six right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's everything. That's that, that's all of them. So you guys, you guys are doing good, man. They got they got another one I was looking at. Like they mostly cause UTIs. Um, that's not for, well. Staph well staff warriors would really call like it, it call, would cause shock. Is is staff saprophyticus cause UTI? Yeah, yeah. This last one, staph saprophyticus. and especially in young sexually active females, and it's the second most common cause, the second to equalize for the leading cause of UTI in females. Okay. Well, they, they had another comparison with the, um, remember the enterococcus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, E. coli would be the enterococcus. No, you mentioned the, um, transpose, transposome. Oh, the transposome. The, trans mm -hmm. the DNA element. Yeah. Yeah, I was saying, I was saying that the, the, the vancomycin resistant, um, Staph aureus gets gets its its resistance from uh, enterococcus that is vancomycin resistant. So it's just an example of how bacteria can give each other immunity to antibiotics. So the the biochemistry behind that is the van A. Yeah, but the, 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 the gene the gene segment van A. Yeah. Yeah, it causes the transfer of the alanine, the alanine. Yeah. On the pectoglycan cell wall, mm -hmm. yeah, convert that now to the alanine, the lactate. Yes, that's exactly right. I couldn't see it better myself. All right, so I think that's it though. Let me stop this recording.